Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, A.J. Hogue, where A.J.'s more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's A.J. with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. English for engineers. That's our topic. English for engineers. What kind of English training studying, practicing, learning, do engineers need? And I'll be discussing a little bit of this book. This is Cambridge English for Engineering, Professional English. And it comes with a little CD. Seems decent. Seems pretty decent. They've got, you know, Cambridge English for nursing. I'm sure they've got ones for other, you know, specific areas as well. But this is an important question because there are certain jobs, certain professions that need English for international work. Engineering is a very common one because uh, in engineering, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of international projects. You know, for example, I just remember uh, traveling in Thailand, for example, and just walking around Bangkok and they're building everywhere in Bangkok. And so many of the projects, right, the, the skyscrapers, the big buildings, bridges, whatever they're making, would be uh, like a, what's called a joint venture, but it's, it's basically there would be a Thai company and then a foreign company working together to make the building or make the bridge or the railroad, whatever. So often it was a Japanese company, perhaps a Chinese company, right? Maybe an American company or a German company or whatever, right? So here's the point. So those Thai engineers working, right, in the Thai half of the project, right, the Thai company, they're working with engineers in other countries. So of course, what language are they going to communicate in. And this is very important. They're communicating about uh, this very large <laughs> project, right? And of course, English. English is the standard language for these kinds of international projects in engineering, in science, also medical. Like I said, I've, I've said before, but I was surprised that I, I actually analyzed, I looked at my kind of longtime members, some of my best members and the members who really become members in, for example, my VIP program and get my Power English course. And they're just kind of some really my best members, the ones that study the hardest and uh, they stay the longest. And I was kind of quite surprised that I have a lot of engineers, a lot of engineers, a lot of doctors and nurses. And then the other groups are managers of higher level managers and then professors and teachers. So this is the these are the groups and a little surprising to me. So I kind of thought, well, I wonder why is that? Because I don't specifically teach, you know, engineering vocabulary. Not yet at least. I don't specifically teach medical vocabulary, right? But looking at this book, I understand why. Because about 90% of what you need as an engineer is really general English skills. And that other 10% are the words, right? It's the technical vocabulary for your field. And of course, even engineering, that's a very general uh, profession. It's a very general word because in fact, right, there are not many general engineers that I know of. There are civil engineers electrical engineers, industrial engineers, aeronautical engineers, right? They specialize. And each of those kinds of engineering will have their own specific vocabulary in English and, of course, in your own language, too. So this is also true of medical. Of course, there are MDs, general, you know, general doctors, you know, kind of family doctors and nurses, but a whole lot of doctors and nurses uh, specialize either in their studies or at least in their jobs, right? So you might have a, a nurse, okay, but she's an uh, emergency room nurse and she works in the ER. And so that's going to require some, you know, some specific vocab connected to ER medicine 
ER nursing, which would be different than, say, the maternity ward where, uh, you know, where women are having babies, right? It's going to be a different, there's going to be some, a lot of different common vocabulary. But that's, you know, that's the technical vocab that you have. And this is true for most jobs if, when you're using English in your job. There are even software engineers, right? People who have that title, software engineers. And that's very, very different than a civil engineer who's building a road, right? And so software engineers, coders are going to have their own little technical vocab. It's impossible for me or any real, almost any English teacher to teach you all of that very specialized vocab. So how do you get it? Well, you get it, you have to, it's the same way you get the other vocab, general English. You have to listen and read a lot, but specifically in your field. If you are an electrical engineer, then you need to be reading papers, articles, books, blog posts, <laughs> whatever, anything. Ab about electrical engineering, written by electrical engineers in English, right? In English. Now, many of you, many of you already learn much of this in your training, in your technical training, you know. So, for example, doctors and nurses, a lot of medical vocab is comes from Latin. So this is great because Latin also is you know, all doctors learn it in every country in the world, nurses too. So, you know, the all the Latin-based vocab, medical terminology, words, great. You're going to learn that in any country in the world. You've got that. You can use it anywhere. Okay, so that's perfect. And uh, there are many programs too where they're going to teach you a lot of that technical vocab they're going to teach some of it to you in English. But if you want to get better at it, this is how you do it. The other way you can do this is listening to English, right? Again, in your technical field. So you might find on YouTube or you might be able to find on other websites where you can listen to, con this is a good one, conference presentations, seminars and conferences, right? where they will record a talk by some engineer, right? And he's talking about a project. Maybe there's a, a, a talk, an engineer, and he's talking about a bridge they built. And he's going to use, of course, the vocab that is used by engineers. Okay, so you can watch little short ones where their presentations, even, you know, very, very basic little documentaries and things, but, but it's, Better if it's a little bit technical, right? So reading and listening, reading and listening in your very specific field. That's 10%. Okay? I can't help you much with that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not an engineer. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a, uh, a nurse. Okay? I just, I, I can't cover every single one of these fields. <laughs> it's too much. Okay? Uh, it's too much for anybody. So you've got, but the good news is you already know your field. Okay? You already know it. If you're an engineer, you already know engineering. A lot of the vocab may already transfer. You may already know a decent amount of, you know, very specific engineering words in, you know, in your specific field or medical or whatever your field is. Okay? The other 90%, and as I go through this book from Cambridge, I, I see this. Most of what is needed is general English ability. So I'll give you some of the things. This is, you know, like, here's some of the exercises they say. Following a meeting, Claudia writes an email to, up, to update an engineering uh, colleague. Read the email. And, you know, and understand it, basically. This is the thing. And what, what, is, what are they focusing on? They're not really focusing on very specific technical engineering terms. They're, talk, they're focusing on phrases, the common English phrases, words like evaluate, work out, work out the magnitude of the parameters. Work out means to solve. It's, it's just an idiom. It's a common idiom. We use it in English, in all kinds of English, right? The word severe. How severe is the vibration in the engine? Severe means how bad, right? How bad is the problem? 
uh, find out about, in order to find out about the dynamics, right? So there's some words in here that are very, you know, kind of technical, dynamic capabilities, uh, you know, engine thrust. Okay, you're going to have to learn some of that listening and to and reading. Again, technical. You can listen to podcasts. I don't, I'm not an engineer, but I'm sure you can find some, uh, you know, every field has podcasts in their own field. You know, I'm an English teacher. I can find uh, podcasts by people who just talk about education and learning and theories and ideas about teaching and how do you help students learn better, right? In English, or I can find I can find uh, podcasts about that. I can find videos about that. So you can find that too. You can find that in medicine. You can find that in business and leadership and management. You can find it in all kinds of engineering. And you're going to have to do that. Okay, You must do that to get that kind of vocab. You need that. But then the other thing you need is the really general ability to have a high level of effortless English fluency. To just be able to talk to people about any topic and be fluent. And then when you need to, you use the vocab for your job. But, you know... The basic structures, the most common words, most of what you'll be using is general English. You're just talking about the topic of business or the topic of engineering or the topic of science or medicine or whatever. Okay. And so now I understand this is why people are getting my Power English course and getting my VIP program. Why all these technical people are joining my courses because my courses are very good at helping you with that, you know, powerful effortless fluency so you can really speak english be understood and be confident and this is a big part of it be confident when you speak english because you know in these fields you need to be confident you need to appear confident a lot a lot a lot of professionals you know if you're just going if you're just traveling to america and going into restaurants and ordering pizza <laughs> It doesn't matter if you're confident or not. You can, you don't even, you hardly need any English for that. Okay, you you could always just use your your phone and sh say, you know, say the word in your language and then show them pizza one, this one. Point at the menu, right? I've done that in many countries <laughs> with where I know no, almost no language. I just, you know, so you don't need much confidence or ability for simple travel. It's actually you don't need much, but when you're using English and so. Uh, some professional level you're having a business meeting with people in your big company but they're from another country and you have to discuss a project and you need to present your ideas you need general english you need to be able to talk in english right fluently the words need to come out you don't want to sound confused and be nervous you don't right because they maybe they don't realize you're nervous about your english they might think you're nervous about your ideas, your presentation, your project, right? It's, it, it can kill the confidence in your ideas. Same with medical, right? A, a doctor or nurse, they need to communicate in a very confident way. You don't need absolutely perfect English, but you do need your English to be understandable to most people. And it, it needs to be clear, fluent, and confident. Okay. If the grammar's a little off, it doesn't matter. What's much more important is that you're confident. And doctors and nurses know this. Your patients are already worried. They're already can be possibly nervous. Or if you're talking to other doctors and, and nurses, right? If, you, if you're presenting an idea or something you did or some research, right? You need, you need to sound confident. Same with engineers, right? These are kind of a little bit high pressure situations where confidence is so important. So this is why you've got, I want you to focus 90% of your time, people in these professional fields, focus 90% of your effort on developing that effortless speaking confidence, fluency. That's why I call what I do effortless English. It's, it's the feeling that you have when you speak yes you need some effort to do it okay it's not lazy english you do have to study you do have to work but the result is that when you speak english it feels effortless like when you speak your own language and then you add the last 10 percent of your specific technical vocabulary 
if you're an engineer, if you're a doctor, if you're an international lawyer, whatever it is, okay, you can add that yourself. You already, you're a master of that already. You just have maybe have to learn some of the vocab, but you already know the ideas, okay, because you're already a professional in that area. So you can do that later or you can just do it at the same time. But the big thing that's so tough for most people, these professionals, is, is that real fluency, that strong, confident speaking and listening ability, that real English ability. Right. That's why people, they need to pass the OET exam. They get my Power English course in VIP program. And I've had so many people say, uh, it, you know, because of that, I passed. I tried the OET prep books. I tried an OET preparation course and I failed. Why? Because, because those courses are too focused on the test and technical, you know, specifics. And they don't. They're not going to help you if your general English ability is not good enough. Right? That's the problem with focusing too much on test preparation. Okay? Any test. Like it might be the GRE. That's the graduate records exam. If you want to go to grad school in the United States, then you got to take the GRE in most, for most schools. So I took the GRE, right? It's basically it's math and reading. But you can buy books. You know, GRE preparation books. You can buy those books. They might help you a little. They'll help you a little. They'll get you'll get used. You'll get comfortable with the test. You understand how it works. You get a general idea of what to expect. But if you're terrible at math, those books will not help you get a high score on the math section. Okay, they're not gonna do it. Just just studying those books is not enough. You, if you're bad at geometry, for example, there's a lot of geometry on those. Thankfully, because that's my strongest math, or it was. Um, so uh, you're gonna have to learn geometry. If your ge if your geometry stinks, if it's terrible, those test books are not gonna help you. You're gonna have to get a geometry book or a geometry program or Khan Academy, whatever. You're gonna have to go through and improve the real skill of geometry, then your test score will be quite good on the math, geometry and algebra. Okay, you're going to have to do that. So this is the problem. People who have, let's say, low English ability, they have a low English general ability. They can't speak fluently. Their listening uh, ability is not very good. And then they take some test preparation course or they buy a test preparation book. And they study it for three months, five months, six months. They take the test and they fail. And they're confused. Why did I fail? Well, you failed because you ignored the real problem. The real problem is your fluency, your, you know, true English ability. Not trying to figure out the test, okay? Trying to figure out all the tricks of the test. It might give you a little boost, a little increase if you already are good. If your math skills are already good, like you're really solid in geometry and algebra, then you study the GRE books. You might learn a couple tricks for a, couple, a few different kinds of problems, and that might jump your score up a little. Okay, so focus, focus, focus. Engineers, focus on general English first. Be, be really good with your general English fluency doctors, nurses, and everyone else, okay? Then ability, and then finally, if you need a test, a little test prep. That should be it. like a couple weeks. That's all you need. All right, let's go into some quick, 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 um, questions from our live program here. Okay, lots of people just saying hi. <laughs> Shaber says there's a Russian uh, speak uh, a Russian speaker. He says you can make you learn fifty thousand new words in English. Just change the ends of words which end by sia in Russian to shion t i o n. I don't know Russian, so maybe. You, there's a similar, you can do similar tricks in Spanish, you know, like Sion, Educación, right? 
<laughs> is education. So it, it looks very similar because the root is, right, the same. Edu means educate, right? And in, in uh, Spanish, C-I-O-N at the end. In English, it's T-I-O-N. So yeah, this is why <laughs> for English speakers, Spanish is way easier to learn than Chinese because Spanish and English share roots in Latin. You know, so there's, there are a lot of those very similar words. And, you know, Russians, all these European languages, they're you're going to find these common roots, right? And then the farther away you get where, where the the language you're learning gets farther from your own language, then there are fewer and fewer of those uh, similar words. And then you got to learn every single word, you know, by memory, and it's not similar to something you already know. So, yeah, he's, he's probably right. Now, let's see what else we got here. Oh, cool. Ildar says, hi, how is it going? You're just in time because I'm an engineer. Thanks a lot for trying to improve my English as much as I'm trying to improve my English as much as I can. Yes, good luck to you. Santosh says, hi from India. Hello to you and to all of India. Mohammed Mahmoud says, uh, when I started watching your videos, I became more confident and energetic. Thanks so much. You are welcome. Thank you so much. Amina. Hi, Amina. Good to see you as always. What time do you feel most energetic? Morning, afternoon, evening, or at night? This has changed <laughs> for me. Now it's, uh, I would say, more late. Later in the morning is probably my best time. Late morning. And this is just my children have trained me. <laughs> so I used to be a night person. The answer used to be, uh, the answer to that question used to be night. I used to, I was a night person. I did my best work at night. I would stay up late until like 2 a.m. or something almost every night. And uh, even when I got bad sleep, for some reason, like around 9 o'clock at night, I would suddenly get energetic again. So that's my that was my natural pattern. But... With twins, uh, they wake up at 4.30 or 5 a.m. every single morning. <laughs> and after four and a half years of waking up at somewhere around that time, before six, certainly, um, I've kind of shifted now. And, and I train jujitsu in the mornings now. So now I find that at night, I'm because of being with my kids all day and waking up so early, at night, I'm like, Ugh. I have no energy. I just, uh, that's my time to just lay around. I might watch some little videos or read something light. But uh, best energy now is mornings. Well, this is an interesting question. Cole Cook says, I have listened to English daily for four hours. And I've been shadowing for two hours, but I've not progressed in speaking yet. Well, how many uh, weeks or months have you done that? Uh, so this is the question. What I've not progressed. I haven't improved yet in my speaking. So my next question is, how have you been doing that? One week, uh, 30 weeks, <laughs> three years? You know, that that's important, obviously, how, how the duration. So let me know, and then I'll try to answer your question. Uh, Mr. Bombardier says, I am an engineer. Oh, good. English is an amazing tool. I'm applying the seven powerful rules to learn effortless English. Yes, amazing. Great. Uh, yeah, it really makes sense now. Yeah, I don't know why. I just uh, I was surprised by it. You know, doctors, nurses, engineers, managers. But now I realize because what's the, what's the common, what's the connection? Because I, I was a little confused. I'm like, well, well Engineers, doctors, nurses, managers, business managers, you know, like in, in a company, and then like teachers and professors. I go, whoa, that seems like very different groups of people. <laughs> but I, I realized, what is the common thing? They all potentially, like a lot of them, are involved in international projects. That's what it is, right? A lot of doctors and nurses are... Uh, well, I mean, you know, a lot of them go abroad or they work in uh, they work internationally, but then uh, many others 
present at conferences and uh, seminars internationally. What are they doing? They need English for that, right? Or they're just trying to learn research and talk to other, uh, you know, technical people. Same thing, like I mentioned with engineers, it makes sense. There's so many international projects now. You know, you travel around to different countries, especially countries where, like, it's booming, right? Where there's just a huge amount of building happening. All these engineering projects, they're building bridges and railroads and you know, places like Vietnam and Thailand and Malaysia. And that's just in Asia, right? Uh, this Indonesia, um, I know throughout Latin America as well, this is happening. So, you know, they're, they're building so much. They're growing so fast. India is another one um, that, you know, and a lot of they're building so all these partnerships. That's the word I was looking for before. <laughs> partnerships with uh, it's like a local company and a foreign company. It's super common, right? I've just noticed this traveling around in my travels is just these partnership projects are so, so common in all of these countries. Uh, so, you know, you see a Japanese company and an Indian company doing something together, right? Lots of Chinese companies doing this, uh, like a Chinese company and a Vietnamese company building something or making something together. Right? It's super, super common. Now, in some cases... You know, maybe there might be a, another shared language that can, might be possible, right? Like if it, I don't know, a Mexican company and an uh, Argentinian company, okay, they can both use Spanish. That's fine, right? Uh, there might be certain countries where they could share, you know, they could use Chinese or maybe some partnerships they could use Russian or something like that. But a lot, a lot, probably most, they're going to use English as the common language to communicate, right? The Japanese engineers talking to the Indonesian engineers. What language do they use? Are they going to speak Indonesian? Are they going to speak Japanese? Probably they're going to speak English, right? Because if one company does a lot of these projects, or then it's too hard for them for all the all these languages, right? Like so maybe there's an in, let's say there's an Indonesian engineering company and they're doing projects with a Japanese company and then they do another project with a Chinese company and then another one with an American company like, like <laughs> to try to learn like to have all their engineers learn Japanese and learn Chinese and learn English and learn German is too much right this is why we have this this is why English at the moment is the global language it's just convenient let's pick one Let's pick one, everybody learn the one, and then it's it's simple. We don't have to all learn 10 languages, right? This is the idea. So English is for now. Look. All right. Oh, Christian uh, Vargas says hi from Colombia. This is my first time here. I learned a lot with you thanks to your podcast. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Tahani says, I am from Egypt, another country that's growing. When I listen for you to understand, but I listen to native speakers on YouTube, um, oh, I sometimes struggle with some. So yeah, in Egypt, you know, these BRICS countries are all going to be growing like crazy. They already are. Um, but again, right, they're, they're typically, you know, Arabic speakers. Eric Arabic, you know, speakers and, you know, engineering or other fields, they need to talk to Russian companies, they need to talk to Chinese companies, you know, Indians, they, you know, they pick a language, it's usually going to be English. So anyway, this problem of understanding all native speakers. So, you know, some, every native speaker is not exactly the same. Right? Native speaker, meaning someone who learned as a baby, right? They're different accents and also different speeds. There's also a different, uh, we call it register, I suppose, but you know, a different level of formality, meaning some are gonna speak very casually using lots of idioms and slang, and others avoid that, don't use it much. So I don't use much slang or idioms, a little, not much. I speak fairly slowly, naturally, and I have a very standard American accent, so easy to understand for most people. So I'm pretty under, easy to understand as a native speaker. But, you know, you find another native speaker 
who speaks faster, who uses a lot of slang and idioms, right? And might even have a, a, a non-standard accent, a less common accent. You add those things together and now this person might be very hard to understand. So you got to get used to them. And you just got to practice with other speakers. You can, this is a great thing about YouTube and other um, podcasts and things. You can listen to Scottish people. You can listen to South Africans. You can listen to Australians and New Ze people from New Zealand and people from different parts of America. And you can listen to professional people who are using a fairly formal kind of English. And you can listen to teenagers who are using super casual English. And uh, you'll gradually get used to them. So what... It's hard to do all of that. So I recommend in the beginning, the most useful is a standard accent and not too casual, not, not super formal, but like kind of, you know, basically what I use. <laughs> okay. This is the most common kind of English you're going to hear in, uh, especially in, in work situations and travel to mostly. Hey, Vladislav, great to see you. Nice to see you. He says, when I started studying my new profession of astronomy, very interesting uh, field, I already understood English articles in this field quite well because of my good general English. Exactly. Great. So he starts a new field, astronomy. Okay, so astronomy. Uh, very technical, right? Science. Is, is, so astronomy has its own, lots of its own vocabulary. But that's no big deal for a lot of stuff because he already has great English. So for him, he starts reading about astronomy. It's, it would be like me starting to study astronomy. It'd like be, me getting an astronomy book and starting to read about it. There might be, like I might see, you know, neutron star. Oh, what's that? I don't know, right? But I already know English, so I can just read the explanation, right? And then I can, oh, that's what a neutron star is. Okay, got it right? Red giant. Mm, and I get, I figured that out, right? So I could pick up a lot of that vocabulary fairly easily because the explanations are all in normal English. I just need to learn the specific astronomy words, but everything else I already would understand. And this is what Vladislav said. He already understands all that. He already has a high level of English. He's very, you know, very high level. So just learning astronomy, uh, it, it's not a language problem for him. He can just focus on the astronomy part, you know, the mathematics and the physics and the, those things. You know, I can't help you with that. <laughs> Sorry. But uh, if you've got a high level of general English, conversational and even reading too, then these specific fields are not a problem for you. And if you, it's even easier if you already know it. If he was already an astronomer, <laughs> a P, had a PhD in astronomy already, um, then, you know, and his English is high, eh, you know, it's nothing. He's, he's, he's got what he needs. He might need to just learn the translation of a few words. It wouldn't be that big a deal. Okay, a couple more and then I'm going to go. I'm trying to keep these a little shorter so I can do them more. Sarah says, the more you listen and read, the more you become confident. This is why I liked our challenges. Good point, Sarah. Yeah, like Asfur says, uh, Morhoff Asfur says, English is the language of modern science. And modern science, uh, academia in general, right? Most uh, scholarly university kind of topics, engineering, professional uh, topics or fields, areas of work, right? But, you know, the, that's the good news about it. I know for you, it means you've got to learn English, uh, you know. But uh, at least the good news is it's only one language, okay? <laughs> uh, it's great. Some people do love learning lots of languages and wonderful. Go ahead, do it. But the truth is, and for most professional reasons and travel too, with just English, you can do pretty much anything you need, okay? Right? It's nice if you also learn German and Russian and Chinese and, you know, Hindi and all the Arabic. <coughs> of course, Spanish, Portuguese. These are all great Japanese. But that's a lot of time and a huge amount of work to learn all of those languages at a high level. 
a level, a professional level where you can use them in your job. You know, yes, you can find on YouTube, you can find these people who speak 10 languages and they say that they speak them all super high level professionally or 20 or something. I don't know. I can't judge it. <laughs> right. But uh, for most normal people who are working and have families, just learning one language, one foreign language, English at a high level professionally is already a big challenge and takes a lot of time. So especially for professional reasons, I recommend focus on English. That's the you're going to get the most benefit for the time. And then if you have more time after that, you know, you can pick another one that might be helpful for you. But uh, uh, English, you should have no problems if you just learn English well. Like uh, Abdel Latif says, hi from Algeria. I am a petroleum engineer. Another example, right? And you can see, you know, engineers, there's so many uh, specialized kinds of engineering. So like a book like this Cambridge book, you know, English for engineering, that's still super general. Like what kind of engineering? Petroleum engineers talking about oil and um, you know, drilling for oil and all these, you know, refining it and all these things. That's way, 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 way different than like, say, an aeronautic engineer, aeronautical engineer who's building airplanes or electrical engineer. They're going to have quite different vocab when they're discussing their jobs and projects. When are you going to do the next book club? Oh, yeah, we'll do the next book club again. I'll do another. We'll do the next chapter of our book. Our book is Ultra Learning. We started our new book last time uh, about a week and a half ago. So we'll get there soon. Thank you. And the profile is Mr. Raccoon with a little raccoon picture. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mei Mei Young says, Do you have any plans for an English seminar in Malaysia? I'm, I've been thinking of visiting Malaysia, mostly just for fun, um, recently. In the past, quite a while ago, actually, I, I did do a couple seminars in Malaysia. Genting Highlands, we did one, and one in KL. But uh, I haven't done one in quite a long time in KL, so or anywhere in Malaysia, so maybe, maybe. I might just visit Malaysia. If I just visit, we'll do a meeting. I'll just, on uh, Twitter... And Gab, I'll put a message, and maybe we can just we can just get together and have a big big group of people and have a coffee or something. And that's I like to do that at least when I travel and meet meet uh, effortless English students. Oh, do one for professionals in Malaysia, says Mei Mei Young. That's a great idea, actually. You know, Malaysia is another one of these countries. There's so many countries now where it's just <laughs> uh, you know the West uh, things are kind of stalled out, but. A whole lot of the world, you know, these countries are booming and growing so fast and there's so much happening, which is why um, that's one reason I love Asia, because Asia is one of these regions, Asia and then, uh, you know, certainly South America, Latin America, I should say, all of Latin America is similar. And uh, and now, you know, you know, all the BRICS nations and then Africa starting to really take off now. So, yeah, exciting for lots of places. Peter Cruz says, what about Mexico? Do you have any plan to come here? I've been to Mexico. We took a, my wife and I took a very nice trip just for fun. It wasn't business. It was just fun. Uh, we traveled around Mexico for a while, Mexico, and uh, it was great. So no plans at the moment because now I'm way over in Japan. So at that time we were in America. It was easy to go down to Mexico uh, and Latin America in general. But uh now I'm way over, now I'm over in Japan. It's gonna it's a long flight just to get to the United States. Then another flight to go down south. So with my kids at the moment, young kids, uh, no plans for the next few years. I think the next few years I'll, we'll just be staying in Asia. We do we I want to start doing a little traveling with the kids. We've we did our first short trip <laughs> last month to Guam, <laughs> very close. But uh, we're thinking maybe just Southeast Asia. You know, Thailand, Malaysia. Singapore, that kind of area. Cool. Sarah says, I took the English place. I took an English placement test. I got an intermediate level without studying. I just listened to your mini stories. So that's just just the mini stories. <laughs> that's great, Sarah. Fantastic. Uh, Sajad Khan says, hi, I am a digital marketer. I like your podcasts. Ah, nice. Welcome. Uh, 
Kok Kok says, I'm a beginner. Would it help me to learn if I visited an English-speaking country? I would say not really, no. Uh, unless you're really an extrovert. What I mean by that is if you just love to get out and talk to people and you don't care if your English is really low and you're just going to talk, try to talk to everybody you meet, yes, it could help you quite a lot. You could do that Benny Lewis thing, you know, just... just <laughs> Speak English all the time. Don't speak your own language at all. And right, that's fine. If you're more of a normal person where that would make you nervous or stressed, then I would say no. I would say try to get to an intermediate level first, then go to an English speaking country. So like I found this just speaking Spanish, you know, like that. Uh, when I went to Spanish-speaking countries, Mexico, for example, as a beginner, it was terrible. I didn't hardly use it. It just felt stressful and a little, you know, a few words, but like not, it really didn't, it wasn't very enjoyable. And then, uh, then I did, you know, for the Camino de Santiago in Spain, I, I, uh, I learned, 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 I listened like crazy and was reading a lot in Spanish only for about four months, but. Luckily, Spanish is pretty close to English. So I got up to like a, an intermediate level, just low intermediate. But that was a huge difference because then that, that trip, I enjoyed myself much more and uh, used Spanish much more. And uh, it was much more enjoyable uh, language and also just the trip. So I think I think it's much more fun to, I think, bite just to get... When you're a beginner, just you can do things alone at your home. You don't need to travel anywhere. When you start getting up into intermediate levels, it might be enjoyable then, because then you can have you can chat with people a little bit, even if it's just small talk. It starts to become a lot more fun. Chris says, "Now I understand why everyone says good morning. It's eleven o'clock at night here. Ah, uh, yeah, well, it's afternoon here in Japan at the moment." Uh, an MD, also a doctor right here. Shadi Hassan says, uh, Hussain says, many stories are amazing and fun for listening as well as improving. Exactly. Exactly. All right, guys, I'm going to go now. Lots of love to all of you, but I'll be back again soon with another show. I've got jujitsu tomorrow, so probably not tomorrow, but uh, Sunday I'll do another show. How about that? Okay. Mwah! So engineers and all other professionals, right? You can watch this again, but... Don't stress too much about the technical words. You can learn those yourself, but you got to get to that effortless English speaking fluency. And with that, focus mostly on that general English. And then the technical stuff won't be too tough. All right, lots of love to you all. See you next time. Bye for now.